Talk into it. Good afternoon. Welcome. I feel kind of odd holding this in front of my face, but uh, my name is Robert Klein. I'm Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a Veterans Day, let's say Veterans Week special of the Campus Wide Leadership Series. Uh, if you haven't taken one, it's a spectacular series uh, this year that Jenny Mehmet has put together and uh, can't think of a better way than opening it the way we're opening today. Special thanks, as always, to the University of Kansas Health System, School of Health Professions, School of Medicine, and School of Nursing. Their continued support of the program is invaluable and much appreciated. It also provides a really good opportunity for people from those schools, faculty, staff, to interact with folks from the health system, and I think that's truly special. Thank you to the KUMC Military and Veterans Affairs Committee, who is co-sponsoring today's event. And then I have to do my introduction. I think most people know Lee. He received his medical, I think this says medical dress. Does that cover that? Okay. I don't know what it says, Bob. Uh, you got your medical dress from the University of Minnesota. I suspect you got a degree there, too. Uh, com <laughs> completed residency in family medicine in Texas, aerospace medicine training at United States Air Force Base uh, Brooks in San Antonio. Served in the U.S. Air Force, a family physician, flight surgeon, combat medicine instructor, practiced medicine in Seattle for 20 years. I think most of us know him from his time here at the University of Kansas uh, Hospital and University of Kansas Health System. In his military role, Dr. Norman is a lieutenant colonel in the Kansas Army National Guard, stationed at Joint Forces Headquarters in Topeka. As the state surgeon of Kansas, Dr. Norman guides medical troop sustainment and training, health services support, biosecurity, and serves as an advisor and liaison to emergency management and homeland security elements. Recently returned from a Middle East deployment where he was the 35th Infantry Division Surgeon. In this role, he was the senior medical commander for over 12,000 U.S. soldiers, coalition national forces, and civilian noncombatants encompassing the three ongoing named operations. Freedom Sentinel, Spartan Shield, and Inherent Resolve. Can you help me pull up this? Uh, but the way I know uh, Dr. Norman is as a, uh, a role model and um, the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> the last time he flirted with danger, danger got clingy. He once received a standing ovation from a juror's box. His thank you cards have prompted your welcome cards. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer those Aggies. Stay thirsty, my friends. That man cannot be trusted. <laughs> Can you guys hear me back there okay? Making, okay, good. <clears throat> well, first off, it's so great to see so many wonderful friends and it's great to be back. I, as you know, I resigned my CMO job in July, deployed in August of last year and uh, am back and then, but I've never done this talk before. So this is the maiden voyage on this particular one. But, and interestingly, I just kept postponing it. And the reason was there was just, I had so much in my head and so many photos and so, and in my deployment diary, this is the deployment diary that I had with me. And uh, so it wasn't until Monday of this week I said, I can do this. So I got my diary out, I transcribed it. Some of it was just, I shouldn't, doesn't bear repeating. Um, some I was so, I was bouncing in, in tactical vehicles and I couldn't read my own writing. Some of it I couldn't even remember what I meant by some of the things I said, but like it or not, you'll be the recipient of some of what I think of my comments that I, I think are what I would call leadership lessons. And this is a campus leadership series. Thank you for the invitation to my military and veteran colleagues, many of them in this room. Thank you for your service, many family members of veterans. And um, it's uh, thank you for your service to this country. Off to the races. The, um, what I want to talk about today is why deploy. I don't have a normal story. Uh, 
I didn't enlist in the Army until I was 61, which is a little bit of an unusual career path. Um, getting there was fascinating. And you can't talk about a Middle East deployment without at least talking a little bit about maps and the mission. Why, were, why are we over there? What did we do? Uh, customs and environment, a day in the life. How does somebody live over there? It's fascinating. And there's many different stories. I know that many of you in this room have deployed as well. So my story will be different than yours. And that's just what we live, isn't it? The work and how it got done, the team that I was blessed to have, and finally coming home and a few summary comments. So here I was. Uh, this is 44 years apart. Uh, that was me in the Air Force. I had red hair back then. Um, I don't now. <laughs> there's uh, the egress of, of hair color over time. But this was me in the Air Force. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, my hair was a little darker then. And uh, I know, it's, it's, it's hard living a life of glamour. But there I was. The, uh, actually, that might not be me, actually. So why deploy? It was a fascinating discussion, I think, is one, and this is Diary Entry 45, why, it, it was time to show up. And, you know, I think back, like, there's a bunch of guys in the back row there, men and women that I've worked with now in the military, and I was inspired by our Army medics especially, and that is to say, you know, I've been teaching Air Force personnel back in the day in the 70s and 80s, got out for a little brief blip in time, 30 years, and then went back and, and I said, it's time to show up and, and, and do this work and to follow them over into the theater. Time to get my skin in the game. And, uh, and I'm really glad I did. The backstory was a fascinating one. We had a gal who was scheduled to deploy uh, as the division surgeon and single mom who had an eight-year-old son that came down with leukemia and the Army was going to hold her feet to the fire. And, and so a bunch of us got together, some of them in the back row there, and said, uh, we can't let that happen. So we found somebody else to cover the first few months of the deployment, and then I went over for the next eight months. So she got to stay home with her sick kid with leukemia. And, you know, that's what you do. You cover for each other. Captain Amber Luchtefeld, I think was our company commander, maybe a uh, nice gal, thought I'd she said because she thought I was in the army because I was too old to join Rotary. <laughs> A little truth to that, maybe. Um, my sister, <clears throat> uh, who's younger than I am, uh, said I was accused me of acting irresponsibly, uh, both when I joined the army and then when I deployed. And I don't think of it that way at all. But you know, inspiration for the work we do comes in many forms. This is a painting I have on my wall at home uh, by a local guy, Robert Quackenbush, good friend. And uh, I like this, I've had it for a dozen years. And what Quackenbush, I said, so what does this mean to you? Because, you know, artists are a little flaky. I said, but what does it mean to you? And he said, well, in our life, we, are, we do our jobs, we line up in like little blocks, we follow the rules, we're good boys and girls. But every now and again, you have to break away a little bit. And then every now and again, you have to break away a little bit further yet. And that resonated with me. So I kind of chewed on that for about a dozen years. And I thought, well, there's lots of different ways to break away. So why not deploy to the Middle East? <clears throat> so getting there, mobilizing, becoming a unit. Um, the, I, I think I might have invented this term, pre-traumatic stress disorder. It was one of the least efficient things that I've ever been through. Um, and, uh, it, and, and, you know, you just want to get going. And yet we're kind of felt like everything we did, our feet was in clay just trying to get through. You know, and some of us just, you know, the important Army things, you know, arm, you know, firearms qualifications and health-related things. And, um, but some of them I thought were kind of dubious value. One, for example, but I, I, learned, I came to learn we did a lot with customs. We did, a, and so the first time I went for a meeting with some of our host nation, uh, we'll say command people, I, the first time I sat and had, had tea for an hour, it was going to be a one-hour meeting, and we had tea for an hour, and I just learned I need to adjust my schedule to the customs and the way things get done. How to handle religious materials, how to talk. You know, it's just so culturally laden, that, and you just want to fit in and, and be respectful. And they don't expect us to be saints over there, um, but um, I was really grateful for the uh, for the the, the, the pre-learning. 
And then there was, it was fascinating. I didn't join into the group until there was a lot of work down at Fort Hood, forming the team and going through exercises. And I didn't jump in the group until about three months later, actually in country in Kuwait. And it was fascinating. After I got to know the commanding general and the chief of staff, they both separately said, we didn't think it was good, a good idea to have you come here, Doc, uh, because we thought that you wouldn't fit in. Quite honestly, you weren't a part of the team formation. But I think there's a little advantage of having gray hair and a, a little more than a little experience to read the tea leaves, figure out how to get in. And, and interestingly, I did see a captain, a young guy over there, right out of his own residency, who came in with a completely different unit, just flounder, flounder, flounder. And the, I think, the, uh, so I think it's really important to say, what does it take to form a team? You can't just airlift into necessarily and have it be instantaneously working. So, and there's, I think, examples of that in our civilian practices as well, whatever it is we do. Major Penny Glenn, back there, nurse at KU, was one of them that, and I, it resonated in my head all the time. She said, because I asked her, she, she's deployed three times, and I said to Penny, uh, what do I need to know? She said, you'll figure it out. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, but she said, you'll love it, and you'll hate it, and you'll love it. And she was exactly right. And you'll see, it's kind of riding the, the wave of loving it, hating it, loving it. So you have to maintain a sense of humor. Despite what Paul Simon says, the words of the prophet are written on latrine walls. Um, it's a dry heat, you're going to, or it's a dry hell. Um, you're going to be fine. You got this. But who ever thought this is the uh, where I uh, Fort Bliss, also ineptly named, um, in Texas? Uh, who would? Why would they name the their, their slogan whatever's next? It's, I guess the WTF question mark was already taken. Uh, <laughs> it does nothing to calm down the anxiety about getting ready to deploy. Maps and mission. Uh, pretty big area. The uh, 35th Infantry, we are in 12 countries, southern Turkey to Oman, from the Sinai of Egypt to Afghanistan. Um, my home office was in Kuwait, but I got to travel a fair amount. So it's a pretty big swath of territory over there that, uh, to cover. And we had troops arrayed everywhere. Hundreds of units, small and large, scattered around everywhere. And uh, there is five brigades. Each brigade is around 24, 2,500 uh, soldiers. And there is only three of the brigades that had uh, doctors. There was two brigades that had physician assistants and, and a lot of combat medics. So I became an itinerant surgeon. And by the way, surgeon doesn't mean surgeon like in the sense of a John Alley type surgeon. There, surgeon means a doctor, a physician and surgeon. So I was, don't be confused by that term. Um, and as Bob mentioned, thanks for the beer, by the way. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Operation Freedom Sentinel was the <clears throat> named mission. You've heard, remember Desert Storm uh, and Iraqi, Operation Iraqi Freedom. The ones that are going on now are Operation Freedom Sentinel, Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq and uh, in Syria, and then Operation Spartan Shield, uh, and I'm gonna, uh, that is in the Arabian Peninsula. Gonna, and the reason I'm telling you this is it, it, it kind of helps to set the stage for the work that we did. But it's, you cannot talk about this region without talking about the religious differences that um, really, um, and oh, by the way, my comments are not that's those of the United States Army. They are purely mine. <laughs> There's nothing that's classified in this briefing. It's uh, all unclassified. But this is the array of Islam. Uh, and, but what we really were, uh, face, I think, is the fact that it's Shia and Sunni are so fundamentally different. We're not going to get into the theology of that, but it's a battle of Sunni and Shia ideologies. And what I think we're seeing, and I think that the, uh, what we are doing over there is that Iran has, wants to have continued influence in connecting, and it's re affectionately referred to as a Shia highway, from Iran all the way across to the Hezbollah of, of Lebanon. So that's why you'll notice that two countries in the way of that <clears throat> are Syria and Iraq. That's why we have Operation Inherent Resolve up there. That's the ideology behind the defensive and offensive action. But this is an extremely complicated region because in some of these areas we have, uh, we are fighting side by side with Iran against ISIS. 
for example. Or Russia will be there in an area that we're adjacent to that is a deconfliction zone where we just say um, that that's a safe zone for you. But those, those, those alliances and those deconfliction zones change every day. So you talk about something that gives you heartburn and gray hair, it's how do we manage an extremely complex environment, which is what it is. <clears throat> I bring this term up, the Levant, yeah, an undefined region around Syria and the origin of the term ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Um, and so this area, I think it actually comes from an Italian word referring to the east or the sunrise or something like that, I think is what the term Levant means. Um, so you'll hear that term uh, occasionally. And one of the things I learned again and again and again is that you can't just read the headlines of newspapers or God forbid television um, and know what's going on there. You have to read history books because this is ancient, ancient history, which led me to my provocative question. Are we really fifth business? And let me tell you what fifth business. How many have read uh, Robinson Davies' Deptford trilogies? Anybody? Fascinating three book series. The first one is fifth business. And fifth, imagine the, the opera or a symphony. Fifth business is, you know, let's say in the opera, you've got uh, two protagonists there, a man and a woman singing to each other. But in the background, by, you have somebody pushing a broom. And, or in the theater, you know, the, the, the court jester is slipping a note to the king that says, you know, in a stage voice, the queen is having an affair with a stable boy. These people that are pushing the broom or lovers walking hand in hand at the back of the stage, they are not necessarily the protagonist, but they are necessary for keeping the plot going. Okay, run the tape forward. Fifth business. And by the way, there's, uh, I've been in situations before I said, am I a, am I a protagonist here or am, am I fifth business? I think that in the Middle East, we're fifth business. We, the Shia highway, the De, uh, centuries old conflicts between Sunni and Shia. I think we are fifth business and are pulled into this. And I personally think that, you know, the, the Arab nations very much are aligned with each other on a religious basis for the most part, Sunnis on the Arabian Peninsula. When we, I think, are not really needed there anymore, we won't be invited to stay. And the, the uh, rules of engagement we are invited into those nations. We are not occupiers in those nations. So I think it'll be fascinating to walk through, watch through time. Are we fifth business? And will we be invited out? I predict that. Now, we're not very good at leaving countries. We've had, there's only, there's 195 nations in, on this globe, and we have military installations in 182 of them, which is a curious fact. So we're better at going there and staying so, but uh, I think we'll eventually be invited out of the Middle East in a, in a profound manner. Okay, I have two slides that are, I kind of hate, but are necessary, so just get over it. The um, Operation Spartan Shia, I'll talk about that. That's the entirety of the uh, Arabian Peninsula. We did three lines of effort, three goals. Unified land operations, in other words, to coordinate ourselves with our coalition forces, host nations. And this, these, these are important. Transitions. Uh, we always have troops coming and going. We always have equipment coming and going. Some people are only boots on the ground in country for 90 days. That's tough to run a business that way. Host nation engagements. I did a lot of work with uh, di different nations, uh, embassies, and land forces. And then finally, the dilemmas that we, oh, this is the Palestinian section of Amman, Jordan, by the way. Uh, kind of a rough and tumble area, I might add. Uh, stabilize the Levant by working with the Jordanian Armed Forces, defend the uh, Euphrates River, the middle Euphrates River Valley, which is the hottest areas of Iraq, uh, and it's settled down some. The west side of the Arabian Gulf, I'll show you that in a minute, to protect maritime strategic choke points. Those have existed for any, as long as humankind have had boats. And I'll show you, meaning how do you control those three strategic choke points? <clears throat> And then Yemen, down the south, that's basically uh, Iran south and west. It's a puppet state, for, uh, and it's falling apart, this country is. And finally, Afghanistan, which is kind of a separate deal in Central Asia to partner up with uh, Central Asian countries. Okay, that's why we were over there. Okay, I mentioned three cho uh, maritime choke points, been there forever. Suez Canal, the Gulf of Aden, right down here. 
which is, by the way, why we have a big military presence right here. And then, of course, the Straits of Hormuz that go into the... Uh, curiously, if you're on this side, this is called the Arabian Gulf. If you're on this, if you live over here in Iran, and they call it the Persian Gulf. And you don't want to be sitting around with a bunch of your buddies in Kuwait and call it the Persian Gulf, because they look at you and say, there are no Persians at this table. That's a sensitive point. I only said that once. Um, the other thing that makes it very complicated, the geopolitics and economics, is that these are all oil and gas fields out in the uh, Arabian Gulf. Um, and they have joint ownership. So here we have with Bahrain, Qatar, um, United Arab Emirates, et cetera, joint ownership with Iran. Oh, and Saudi Arabia too. So there's joint ownership of these gas and oil fields, which makes it hard to do battle because they have, you know, deep mines and deep wells and things like that. So I'm trying to paint a picture of how difficult it is to navigate these uh, economic, ideologic, and religious differences. And it's all about liquefied natural gas. I took a picture of that when I was flying over there one day. That's how they haul the stuff away. They bought it for pennies on the dollar, these, these mine or these uh, oil, these uh, wells, I guess you call it, for liquefied natural gas. And now it's just immensely profitable. That's why Qatar, for example, has the highest income per capita of any uh, country on earth. Okay, customs, this is fun. Um, when I was in, in flight, when I went to aerospace medicine training, I actually trained with Iranian flight surgeons because we were still allies back in the 70s. Then the Shah was deposed and the rest is, of course, has become very fundamental. This is a picture of the Iranian uh, gymnastics team from the mid-1970s. You would not see that today. The attire for women has changed rather dramatically. For, and this, this is not Iran, but it, it might as well be. It's very much uh, changing of the roles. The, on the one hand, during the daytime, this mannequin uh, had a kind of a slinky uh, outfit on, but it, it would always have her fa this mannequin's face covered, which is kind of a curious dichotomy. Women in Oman will be able to drive taxis for this. I don't know that that's actually happened yet. And then I was doing rounds in a hospital, and here is uh, this slinky woman on a Ferrari for an advertisement for an erectile dysfunction medicine. <laughs> so, uh, so there is bridges from one from Saudi Arabia into Oman, and the the women will drive there in very traditional garb. They'll get on the other side of the bridge and t take off, and underneath it's you know yoga pants and and high heels. So, it's a. Uh, there's a lot of ideologic battles that are going on all the time, and I, it's just interesting to be stuck in the middle of that. Environment. Um, very much contrasting environments, really. That's me on a uh, dusty morning, looked like that. That's like noon when the, when the dust storm would roll in, and, and uh, it, it would vary from very fine powdery, almost like... Uh, what do you call it? What kind of sugar is that, Bob? It's uh, powdered sugar that would just get everywhere, you know. And then, um, and then there'd be just absolutely spectacular clear skies. That's actually in Jordan. Um, and the cities are, are just remarkable. That's in Kuwait City. That was Freedom Tower built by uh, the Kuwaitis to recognize and honor Americans, uh, the U.S., for the significant role in... Uh, Desert Storm in, in freeing, freeing Kuwait from the attacking Iraqis. A day in life, where to start? Tempo routines, battle rhythm. Those things are, uh, the pace was amazing. I came back, it took me a long time to just to exhale and because we worked every single day. Uh, and uh, every now and again on Sunday, we would get a, an afternoon off or something like that. I loved it. I hated it. I loved it. Penny. Um, it was, uh, but the pace was incredible, and it wasn't just a daytime thing. Wars are not fought on an eight to five. Uh, OPSEC, operational security, one of the things we had to be very careful of. And many of you in this room are my Facebook friends. You may have, and you, you, I'm sure you saw that I was always cryptic and didn't say anything that was particularly sensitive. I might have photos from where I was, but I'm never where I am today or I'm going to be tomorrow. Operational security is very tight. Uh, language. I love this, jargon monoxide poisoning. There, the, the jargon in the uh, army is, is, you think medicine's bad. Um, <laughs> the army's impossible. And I've asked people to define what that meant by co-ops or something. They say, I don't, 
I don't know what it is, but I know what it is. <laughs> okay, fine. And then communication is fun, interesting, difficult, variable internet and Wi-Fi. But one of my most interesting ones was I was up and I was in Iraq and we had a, uh, I was walking, uh, I think it was a tank. And some of those newer model tanks have their own Wi-Fi. And I had my phone, I had two phones, my issued phone and my regular phone, Sprint phone, um, the same one I have today. And I, my phone rang, it was January 15th. I looked and I recognized it as a U.S. number, uh, Pocahontas, Iowa. And only one person I know in Pocahontas, and that's my 100-year-old Aunt Mary. So I, and I'm in a full battle regalia, you know. And uh, hello. Oh, hi, Aunt Mary. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh-huh. Yeah. She was, and she was on my case about not sending a Christmas card. Um, she said, you've sent me a Christmas card every year. Where are you? I thought I was going to get grounded. Um, so, you know, command can't find me, but Aunt Mary found me. Uh, I, I still laugh about that. Um, the commanding general is a guy from right here, um, um, Major General Vic Braden. Uh, he's still the commander, soon to retire, I think, as a, he's a two-star general. He and I traveled a lot, worked together. And one of the things that I think is an interesting, and I, this is diary entry number 86, I learned that about integrating time, space, and purpose. And when you think about what we do in our daily lives, how do we get work done, time, space, and purposes are pretty, if you can fit pretty much everything into that, into that paradigm, if you will. So this is, I inculcated this into our regular meetings of my surgeon section, uh, my team, and uh, it was helpful, real helpful. And, and I don't have a slide about this, but I'll tell you anyway. The, um, we had, I, I participated every day on what was called the targeting working group. And that was a group that decided what were going to be the targets of, uh, because we, uh, of like artillery, we'll say. And because um, the U.S. is very concerned about target selection for obvious reasons. If you're going to bomb somebody, you want to be the right targets. Other nations are not as picky about that. One of the things I worried about was when I was flying, there was other nations, like we'll say Syria, would shoot missiles that were heat-seeking missiles, and if they miss their target, they keep going until they find something or they just run out of fuel, and then they fall into the desert. But um, so what my team did was we would integrate time, space, and purpose to figure out not what are we bombing today or what is the mission tomorrow, but what's it two days from now, five days from now. Because we only had so many medevac helicopters to go around. The golden hour, if you look at the Arabian Peninsula and if you look at concentric circles of where your helicopters are, a one hour, golden hour to, to rescue people, it looks like a map with, of Swiss cheese because there's huge swaths where there, you cannot get the helicopter that person in anything close to an hour. So we always had to be looking down the road, down the road, down the road. And that was a challenge. Um, and then finally, back to the time uh, close, close fight would be what are the current operations, hence back to the jargon monoxide poisoning. Current operations, middle range is whatever, that's defined as future ops, and then the deep or shaping kinds of activities that are done. And I, this has actually changed my thinking a bit on how to think is, time, space, and purpose, and then close, mid-range, and deep. And then finally, uh, offensive, you know, de uh, decisive action can be offensive, defensive, or stable, just stability, which you are, don't just do something, stand there. Sometimes you don't have to do anything, but you can let it take its time and play out. Some of these things take patience. And uh... then there's some curious deployment life cultural affectations. Many people that don't normally chew tobacco or smoke do when they're, I call it, detached from the disapproving <laughs> eyes of their spouses. Um, <laughs> it's just, that happens. And then there was, uh, every Friday night was Holy Smokes. Uh, that was, the chaplains held that. They would provide cigars and sit around and loosely talk about spiritual, religious things or just to go. And I'd go up almost every Friday if I was around. I didn't smoke cigars. As a matter of fact, I still have those two. I bought two cigars, but I still have them back in my house if anybody wants them. Those are the two. Um, but I'll tell you, in, in, a, in a deployment environment, the, it's really nice to be able to have kind of a, whether you call it religious or 
psychological discussions or just prayer groups or whatever. It's really nice. And the chappies, I tell you, I got a terrific amount of uh, respect for those guys. People, it's fascinating. I decided that with 12,000 soldiers, that there was no change in net weight of all 12 of those. Some people, because there was an endless amount of food, it wasn't particularly good, but, um, and, there, and, some, and then people would get very physically fit. So there'd be people that would lose a bunch of weight, and there'd be people gain a bunch of weight because of the endless food. I decided this, the net net was about the same. Uh, in the long run, that's my. And then one of the things that I think was, you don't, you know, it, it, our enemies don't need to shoot at us. They just need to provide a gymnasium for people that want to get fit, and send them home with weights and a treadmill because we have so many overuse injuries, ruptured biceps, tendons, and blown out knees. It's, and uh, to be honest with you, I think that, I think the army doesn't do enough to prepare the soldiers for not getting injured. I think that's a, something we need to spend a lot more time with. And then one curious uh, affectation I thought was not talking about it, because our soldiers get into dangerous situations as you will. No. And so there's lots of euphemisms. This is Diary Entry 25. When, when somebody's going over the horizon or downrange or up north or down trace or in the fight, I could go on and on. There's lots of euphemisms for that kind of help to kind of candy coat it just a little bit uh, and not having to talk about it because you know soldiers and marines and yeah even marines are are uh, supposed to be tough individual and tough-minded individuals and so that's there's a, a euphemism for this we see this in clinical medicine too don't we about you know the euphemisms you, we use it kind of kind of separate a little bit the, the idea of death or danger okay um, those were my feet. Um, I had a CHU, a containerized housing unit, uh, 8 by 15, which is a little bit smaller than Bill Cosby's cell, I might add. Um, but, it, and it didn't have, mine doesn't have water. So uh, needless to say, when I needed to use the facilities, it, it meant putting on my sandals and schlepping down. Uh, but I'll tell you, no complaints. I had my own CHU. Uh, there, if for people of lower rank, they would oftentimes have three people in there in in bunk beds. So, you aren't going to get any complaints from me. That was living large. And then just the fabric of life was it was fascinating. I thought one, yeah, I keep a calendar, voraciously read things. At Christmas time, hung mistletoe outside my chew door. It was that's. <laughs> Nothing happened there, uh, Mary. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> this is my coffee maker. Um, I, had to, I did have a hot pot, and I would heat up water. And then uh, I had a cup with, a, with a filters. I'd make my coffee every morning. That was the high point of my day. I learned uh, that there are certain customs that you do and don't do. Uh, <laughs> and little things really mattered. Warm showers, showering alone. Um, that was, sometimes it's, you know, that's not, it wouldn't seem like a huge thing. Having, but I mentioned before, my own containerized housing unit. And my two, the temperature control mostly worked, although it didn't work in the wintertime, and it did get kind of chilly at nighttime. It would, and uh, so I had to bundle up and shiver a bit. And then when I was gone once, uh, it, the air conditioning went out, and I learned that, yes, solid antiperspirant melts and is in a puddle on your floor when you get home. Uh, so that does happen. The place smells good. Um, but um, Oh, by the way, the day I arrived in August of 17, it was 130 degrees. That was the temperature. Laundry, one of the things I really liked to do was laundry just because it was about the only thing that was, it was a semblance of normal. I liked to cook and do things. Um, but the one thing that was kind of semi-normal was laundry, so I'd make laundry, smell like fresh laundry, and I'd read a book and chit-chat with the other guys, women. Few financial transactions was kind of fun. We, you know, you don't pull out credit cards, you don't have, you don't use U.S. money or even foreign currency very often. It's kind of fun. Hated my issued phone. That was when my issued phone went off. It was bad. It was something bad, and uh, I came to just. Dreaded. Sleep. I slept well, and I still don't know why. Um, when I, my head hit the pillow at night, I was just a goner until the phone rang. But um, I think, and maybe somebody knows more, I think, you know, I usually have a glass of wine or a martini or something at night, and I think alcohol must really screw up people's sleep cycles. 
I'd, learn, I'd like to learn more about that because because uh, there were, I didn't have anything to drink over there the entire time, except for that one week I was up in Armenia. Um, the um, <laughs> but I slept really well. And contentment. Uh, this is uh, diary entry number four. By the way, in one through 135. The ones that are higher up are the things that I tumble to earliest in the rotation. Contentment is a clean routine, but true happiness requires women, martinis, and steak. Um, the biggest work challenge, I think, was in was getting up to speed. Um, this is a very sophisticated graph that I did on a, on a white torn sack. And over time, this is where I came in. I was fat, dumb, and happy. I thought, no, I got this. And then it was like, oh my God, <laughs> what have I gotten into? Because there was so much I didn't know. And there's a lot of army doctrinal things that I just couldn't know. I've never gone to charm school to learn those things. Um, and then there's a variety of paths. And I, I kind of extracted this from other people as well. Some people just kind of maintain that high level chronic anxiety. Some get to a new level that think, I think I got this, but never really. And then some say, I've got this. Remember the early thing, I've got this, you know. And this, I wound up here. I wound up here saying, you know, bad things happen. And, and yet I knew the team. I knew how to get things done. And I, got, I eventually made it to number six. And so that, you know, my phone would ring. I, my pulse wouldn't race. How we traveled. Uh, this is Sergeant Major. Um, it was in my team, uh, Steve Brandt. Uh, he's a, a high school teacher in Kansas City, Kansas. This is in the in the side of C-130, like you see up here. And then these guys, the uh, helicopter, the medevac helicopters and and uh, ground ambulances. One little interesting story, and it was in my last month I was there, I was flying in one of these guys, and we were going into Jordan over Syrian air, airspace, and we lost our um, navigation uh, from the air airplane. So we were up at 28,000 feet or something like that. And we're nervous over Syrian airspace anyway. So we had to drop down and follow streetlights all the way into Jordan. Uh, that was like a little nervous, but didn't die. Um, the work, what is the surgeon section? So I was a head division surgeon, headed up the surgeon section. We had two broad areas and that's still uh, what health services, which is medical care to the sick, injured, et cetera. This was the one that was a little bit new to me, uh, force health protection. We had all of behavioral health. So uh, one of my team, uh, Trevor Patton, PhD, was my lead behavioral health guy. He's down in Wichita, a PhD neuropsychologist. He basically came in and said, we're going to set this up like a distributed uh, mental health practice. We're going to cover for each other. Boom. Great. Water and food safety. You know, and one thing is there's a lot of local contractors from the host nations, and we always worried about is this really clean water or is it gray water? Because gray water is cheap and clean water is expensive. So we got duped a few times, and I, we would see things that people would have rashes and infections and things, and, figure, and then we'd back into it and figure out, oh, this is the gray water. This isn't good stuff. Veterinary services for our working animals. Feral animal control, a uh, problem. Uh, but I, you know, one of the things I learned is I've been a chief medical officer for 25 years. I've been herding cats, known as doctors. <laughs> Feral animal control, how hard can that be? <clears throat> They're actually more trainable, I think, at times. But <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Patient tracking, it, you know, is, is, it's, believe it or not, it's easy to lose people when you're starting move, moving a lot of people around. And... Um, it's really important not to lose track of people. Uh, so we had one guy, um, long, tall, uh, Brian Blackman, who's a captain who was a very decorated combat medic. And then he went to college and came back in as a, uh, and was our pad patient, I don't know, tracking guy. Terrific. Medevac, of course, we always were having to position our aircraft around and so that we could be responsive. The guy that headed that up, uh, Eric, um, was is a Olathe policeman in his day job. He himself is a uh, Black Hawk pilot and was on the team. This was something I didn't know about. And yet the, the division surgeon is responsible for the suicide response team. And when somebody commits suicide, it ain't 
it's not a happy time for anybody. And it, and you think about when somebody commits suicide, it's concentric circles out around that. See, so it's easy to get to 500 soldiers that need attention. So uh, linking this and this, and we do so much work with suicide prevention. And um, it was hard. Uh, and then I've said, I mean, mentioned this young captain that came in as a, a different uh, organization. And the very first day he got there, somebody, a, a woman hung herself and, and died. So I took this young guy under my wing because I unfortunately had been through this. It's not fun, it's not easy, and it's really critically important to attend to this because it, it, it affects everything for the, those people's remainder of their lives, obviously, the people around them. And then finally, civil affairs and embassies. That was really fun. Uh, love working with those guys uh, at the different embassies. Uh, very receptive, very warm. And by the way, I didn't mention this. I think overall, the U.S. personnel, uh, military and civilians, we have a very high... Uh, Oh, I don't know, approval rating, 98%, 99% approval rating. We're, they love us there, you know, for the most part. There's occasional bad guys that don't, but mostly we're loved. Now, the, the same people you ask that don't necessarily love our policy or policies in the region, but they are very good at, at doing a deeper dive and separating the service members, for example, from the policymakers. So this is what I planned. And this is what really happened, you know, time, space, and purpose. Just when you think you got it figured out, oops. But it was only every day <laughs> that way. So we had to MacGyver everything. Um, you remember MacGyver? Uh, he could do anything. You know, he could build, he built that bomb. You might not know this, but he did it out of a paper clip and a ball of lint uh, was what he took to me. So remember I talked about um, physical fitness related injuries. What is this? Weights, barbells, this is a lifting out at a remote site. Yeah, those are uh, sound from a structural, forget about it. Um, you know, so we go to like a coffee shop in the US and we have pumpkin spice latte bifolds on the table. There we have rabies. Um, uh, remind people not to pet animals in the Middle East because they're uh, the endemic rabies in the Middle East. And this this came up because I had a call on my phone that I hated one night, and it was a, a, a young medic, 19-year-old, who and he said, hey, can you get, hey, Doc, oh, hi, can you get, it's 2 in the morning, can you get rabies from a hedgehog? And I said, you know, I don't know that on the tip of my brain here. Can I think about that for a minute? And he said, sure. Um, and I, I said, I'll call you right back. He said, well, I don't have a good Wi-Fi, but I'll stay right here. So I Googled it up, uh, and, and I found, yeah, you can get rabies. There's been actually people die from rabies, from hedgehog bites. So I called him back, and I said, we got to get vaccine and globulin in there. We don't have cold chain guaranteed for getting the stuff there. I said, we're just going to have to MacGyver it. And he said, I don't have good Wi-Fi here. And I said, okay, why? What are you worried about? He said, I don't know how to Mac Google up MacGyvering it. <laughs> is, that a, is, that a, is that a military doctrinal element? <laughs> and I said, no, let me rephrase it. We'll have to figure it out. <laughs> so we ended up not being able to, to send two little this big flasks to Syria, which is where this was, we ended up having to go in and medevac the patient out to Baghdad and then up to uh, Launchstuhl to uh, get the patient treated, and she did fine. But MacGyvering everything. Love working with these guys. This is uh, Colonel Nawaf, Kuwaiti Land Forces, with a couple of his buddies, some of my folks. And uh, I just love this guy. I got invited to lots of festivals and those kind of things. Uh, became a good friend. He, he quite westernized. He trained, he's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon trained in Boston for at least part of his time. Here I'm up in Armenia, which is a very typical pose, like, oh my God, how, how'd I get here? Um, but um, that was back to the MacGyvering. We just had to figure out stuff. But, but th those are happy things. Sad things, again, I may comment about this. It was a week, it was a year ago last Sunday, 
that I got a call that, about a soldier who woke up. And, and these things just still puzzle me. They just they gnaw at me. And that is, why did this guy wake up? He, he wakes up every day at 4.30. He's a, he's a, a, a helicopter, attack helicopter pilot. Why did he make coffee like normal and then shoot himself? And didn't even have a cup of coffee that he'd made. What, what, isn't that a, I don't know how to think, even think through that. Uh, why would a young, another different situation, young soldier, 20 year old guy who killed himself, it was less than a week later with, and he had, he took off, he made a very special point of taking off his name tape before shooting himself and killing himself. You know, I like, we aren't gonna know who he is, you know, of course we're gonna know who he is. And then I won't go into all the details, but there wasn't a week that went by that we didn't have some kind of a stroke. And imagine the, the, how hard it is to say somebody's got an acute neurologic event going on out in the boonies. Is it a hemiplegic migraine or is it a thrombotic or, you know, occlusive stroke? And you can't do anything about it. So you'll say, well, let's go ahead and put him on aspirin because it's the best we can do, you know. Or somebody that 20 year olds that are, that hit 300 on their, PFT test, which is the max out on the PFT test, and that they keel over. We saw these things, we saw something every week, and it was stuff we just didn't expect to see. But one of the things I do know is that when the government shuts down, people overseas get really sad really fast. January 22nd, what was going on then? NFL playoffs. So we, our guys, none of, when I say guys, that's men and women, didn't have NFL playoffs bad. We did have the Baltimore Raven cheerleaders that came over and performed, but uh, that was not the same as having NFL football. So when somebody thinks that they can say, I'm going to use shutting down the government as a lever to make Congress do this or Congress do that, I think we have the obligation to say, fine, shut the government down, but let's keep paying our soldiers. This guy didn't get paid. And his, and his wife and new baby in Encinas, Ensenada, California, were getting evicted. Ooh. Yeah, ooh, exactly. Uh, cats, cats are evil. Um, <laughs> these are the first four pictures I pulled up of cats. <laughs> they, uh, cats is uh, Latin for Satan. Uh, <laughs> I might have made that up. Um, but one of the things that we see, because see, there's government cats. Every installation has government cats. They're neutered, in theory. Um, they're immunized, and then they're released for feral animal control. And then, but they're trapped every year, immunized, and checked for this or that. But everybody thinks, oh, they're cute, and they pet them, and they get bit. And Mark Scott, how many times do you see cat bites the size of boxing gloves come in? These things are evil, best avoided. And there's 365 million of them in the world, and I think that's about 365 million too many. Um, but there's, so uh, happy times. This is my team at Thanksgiving. We had a really good Thanksgiving meal. Thank you, uh, John Alley, for the whoopee. John gave me this before I deployed. A whoopee is, a, it's a poncho liner, and without it, it would be cold. Without it, it would be wet. Without it, would be unhappy. So they call this is a whoopee. Um, and fascinating, this, I took this picture, it was like a bright sunny day, and then in five minutes, the sun was blotted out, and no, you couldn't see any, and then the, with sand for days on end. So quite a study of contrast. Camels everywhere. There's no other animal that in one day, you can eat it, race it, milk it, and ride it, all in the same day. And uh, that was one of the things that no Colonel Nawaf took me to, which was kind of fun. By the way, this is a, what they race them with, we call them robot monkeys. I'm sure there's a more official name, but they're um, radio controlled um, things that whop the camel as it runs. <laughs> yeah, they don't put humans on top of them to race anymore. But you gotta love this face. I'm not talking about Laura. I'm talking about, well, yeah, Laura too, but um, aren't they, they're quite the creatures. They're well adapted for what they do. Dramatic contra con contrast. I talked about Freedom Tower. You can get an idea from the palm trees how massive this is. This I talked about Major General Braden. He, uh, he and I traveled a lot together. We were doing battlefield circulation, meeting with uh, soldiers out in the faraway places. So he, this is the very first time I was out there with him. He's about six feet, nine inches tall. He, he does all the, prosecutes all the capital murder trials in the state of Kansas. And he's an attack helicopter pilot. So he's uh, 
he's okay. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, he was asking, he was giving a little talk, and then nobody's asking questions, and I thought I was just there to be arm candy or something. And he said, uh, okay, doc, it's yours now. And I said, okay. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be talking. Um, okay, guys, there's only five things you have to remember. And I had no idea what five things were going to be. <laughs> but one of them was cats, was ev cats are evil, I can assure you. So on the very same day to experience this at the United Arab Emirates, and that, oh, and sleeping in a tent, those tents I might add for a couple of days, and then the next night to go into Abu Dhabi, that was from the, uh, my patio uh, overlooking uh, the Grand Mosque. Isn't that beautiful? So I've talked about this, combat-related injuries, normal injuries and illnesses I expected, adjustment to deployment stressors and dangers to get around, but I was really shocked by the number of accidents, serious illness in healthy people, behavioral health crises, the, the fast tempo, and the creativity, i.e. the MacGyvering required. The largest outbreak of cholera in the history of mankind is going on then and now in Yemen. So we are in, the, in a very much in the cholera area. The influenza in the Middle East and this part of Africa were even greater last year than in the United States. And you had a bad influenza year here last year. And we had, of course, I had no request for medical or religious exemption by any soldier for the 12,000 that got immunizations, and we didn't have any influenza in our soldiers. Isn't that something? There's a bad illness there called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus, kills about half the people. I went out to some of these little hospitals, check them out, and they say, oh, yeah, we have six or eight cases a month here. So we did everything we could to not have our soldiers to go there. Interesting, beautiful Jordan. Uh, I, it was one of the places I spent a fair amount of time because they didn't have any physicians over there. It's also dangerous. Um, Zarka, you may remember back in the day, he, he, uh, we killed him, actually, in 2006, Abu Masab al Zakari. Uh, Zakari, this name and this name are the same because that's where he's from. So this is right out the back door, he, and he took his name after his place. So on the one hand, you see beautiful Jordan. On the other side, as soon as you're a, a mile off post, uh, or less, you, then you, you uh, have to be worried about the environment. I, I should have mentioned, we didn't really feel secure with this, so at nighttime when we would walk, we would walk away from the street lights because we, we were always concerned about and uneasy about snipers along the edges of these rims where we went. Like I said, 98% are love us, but that still leaves a few that don't. One, this was a day I thought was my last day on earth, but as you can see, it didn't work out that way. This is the Amman Jordan Embassy. This is probably one of the most dangerous embassies in the world. We had American troops. We had uh, Jordanian armed forces. I was there with my personal security detail, a driver and a medic, and th they won't let you stop by these New Jersey, I'm sure they're not called that in Jordan, barriers. So I said, okay. Not ideal, drop me off a block away. I walk across in my civilian suit, and this ratty, uh, this is not really me, that's actually at the Reagan airport, but it's for, you're supposed to, it's for dramatic uh, effect. Um, it was rather like that. This sedan parked between me and where I was going. These four guys got out and grabbed me, and, uh, and then started kissing my cheeks. <laughs> Um, and I, they said, we love you. We want you to know how much we appreciate you. And I thought that was my, I really, I thought that was my last day on it because the door was open. Um, so uh, it all happened so quickly. My deployment team couldn't have done better. I won't go through each one of them, but, uh, you know, the guy who tracked people, helicopter pilot, uh, sergeant major, the big hurt, this guy, you know, when he, when somebody, when somebody, he's a combat medic, when somebody needed to, an escort, somebody needed to go figure something out, we'd send some of these people out and they would accompany, and it was just like other duties as assigned. It was an incredible, incredible team, people. The big guy here was uh, the PhD neuropsychologist I mentioned from uh, Wichita, he, so good. Last couple things. Um, we're doing some things here, the Advanced Medical Sustainment and Trauma Training, AMSAT, program, which we're here at, at uh, KUMC and the health system, and the military training program, which is a fund in KU Endowment. In the back there are my colleagues, uh, uh, Lawrence, Sergeant Swenson, 
uh, is here. She's uh, uh, Penny Glenn, Major Glenn is there. Dr. John Alley, who you know. These are the guys that have been putting this course together. We've got other docs back here that are uh, volunteers. We have, what, 70, 60 volunteer physicians and, and others that train in this program. This is where we train combat medics, we, both from uh, Kansas Army, National Guard, Air Guard, a little bit on the Missouri side, some high patrol, some SWAT team medics. Um, the Army doesn't have money to have uh, have money, have money to train everybody with hands-on training. So this is something we've taken on, and we've, we're going to build this, the heck out of this program so that everybody in a two-year period, every medic in the state, Air and Army, or anybody that wants and needs that training can get trained. If, you, it's a tax deduct, if anybody wants to, there's a tax-deductible contribution. We've set up the fund there, and Jen Pop or Ali or these guys I mentioned would be happy to talk with you about it. And the reason is is because... It is so critically important to protect these war fighters, and this is a program right here that there's nothing like it in the United States, in any of the states. The biggest challenges uh, were turnover. Uh, a couple things I learned. It's not about what's right and wrong. Sometimes you just have to, what are the risks you're willing to accept? Those are not the same. The TCA, the float pool. These are, both of those soldiers I mentioned who killed themselves were TCA'd in. They were put on loan so they are not with their home unit. You have to keep a close eye on people then when they don't have their home unit. Uh, Moira Mulhern and uh, those guys in, uh, what do you call it? Uh, turning Point. We're starting to work with her about resilience training because there's a lot about deployment that's Groundhog Day where the, the next day is similar to today. And what I think we need to train people, this is true for all of us in this room, how do we have it be um, Groundhog Day with a good day? and not have Groundhog Day be a bad day. And I don't know the secret sauce on training that. You better be all in when you deploy. Um, and just get used to the fact that you have to have a people back home to help you, because if it's going to go wrong, it's going to go bad at home, it's going to go ha happen while you're on deployment. It's just, uh, that guy is Coberline, Major Coberline. He was our battle desk. He was the one that ran our battle rhythm. He was a, he's a cop in Kansas City, Kansas, who got shot uh, here at home, actually, and our own uh, Jim Thomas and uh, Bruce Toby put him back together again, and he's a terrifically loyal guy. He served with us, loved him dearly. Um, I would recommend, don't pay attention on the left, uh, but it's about how do you prevent, prevent PTSD in soldiers coming back. I would recommend this book. It's very small, called Tribe, John, uh, Sebastian Younger. He's the one that wrote A Perfect Storm. He's a war correspondent, excellent book. Uh, one of the things that I think is true is that the, the bottom statement is a, one of the things that soldiers have a hard time to is coming back to a very discordant and fractured America. And I think one of the things we have an obligation to do is work with our and elect people who want to unify because the discord in America is not working for our soldiers that are coming home. And finally, the importance of support from home. Uh, books. This is not sushi. Uh, Amanda Gartner sent me some candies, and I didn't share them. They were so good. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Lockton Company, uh, Denise, there we go, sent uh, these things, uh, care packages. Uh, this is stuff you just don't have, and it's expensive, and, and uh, soldiers really appreciate it. I love the messages. I put every one of them up on the wall. And finally, coming home. You know, Mary, uh, I asked her for a little tiny welcoming home, and she's little and tiny, and gave me a welcoming home. My two kids, I brought him this Soviet Union hammer and sickle hat when I was up in Armenia. He looks a little nonplussed by it at Christmas time. <laughs> my daughter Erin has it, um, and two grandsons, my dog. Uh, and then finally, uh, Shelley Bush uh, sent a picture, um, and that's beautiful Kansas City. So, I mean, the coming home. Last comment. Um, you carry all sorts of crap. I'm 66 years old. I got so tired of carrying all this stuff because every, you know, what was the gear? 50 pounds when we were out, anytime we were outside the wire. But I had three 100, essentially 100 pound duffels. And uh, so I said to Captain Aaron Hamby, Hamby, can we, can I send these with somebody else? <laughs> and she said, no, you can. And I said, so what, uh, how old is Grandpa Hamby? She said, God, I don't know. He must be in his 60s. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, well, would you make Grandpa Hamby carry this stuff? 
without a beach, missing a beach? He said, yeah, if he was in the army, I would. <laughs> That's not the right answer. <laughs> any, uh, we're at the, essentially the end of our time, but if there's any questions or comments, uh, but thank you very much, and thank you for your support for all of us. Any questions? I saw only um, one mention of a little country that sits surrounded in that area. It was on the last slide mm -hmm. um, in terms of Israel. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Well, um, everything we do is organized to protect Israel and to, uh, we work very collaboratively with Israel. And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's interesting because there is a balance there. As soon as the president came out and said, that moving the embassy to Jerusalem, all of a sudden we went on red alert and continued with that. So you, it's like everything there is said through a megaphone. So I know that the elected officials and certainly the in-country commanders and everything have to, it's a delicate balance because uh, I know we'll be invited out um, and it's highly contingent on our, how visible our support of Israel is. And yet that's, that's the doctrine. So, yeah. You know. Must be some questions. I'm not going to throw it. <laughs> if you guys need to go, I mean, I'm not. Feel free. I'm not. I'm, I'm a microbiologist. So, what kind of infectious diseases were common? Did you have leishmaniasis or no, not much. Um, and I think because mostly we one uh, had we were pretty uh, attentive to food and water and didn't have close contact with animals for the most. It was mostly cholera, of course, malaria. Um, norovirus, which would sweep through and take out 80 to 100 people. Matter of fact, there was one. I was uh, annoyingly persistent in making sure we had hand washing stations and that kind of thing. And everybody kept saying, oh, yeah, doc, yeah, fine, whatever. They got, there was one plane that went out that was a contract plane for soldiers coming home. They got so sick so quickly from norovirus, and it must have been, I won't use the term shitstorm. Um, it, um, it must have been mess. Um, they landed in Cyprus and they were there for like a week because they had so many people with norovirus. And then, of course, influenza and then the common respiratory stuff. Uh, there were a few unusual things, but not for the most part. Yeah. Um, I'll repeat it. Oh, right, here. Uh, yeah. Here you go. So with all the different diseases that's going on out there and then just evaluating the processes that you guys have, is there like a dedicated research team or department or is that, was that under your, um, you know, under your umbrella or how, how do they go about evaluating how well, you know, everything's working out there? Yeah, um, that's a great question and the source of a lot of heartburn. And the reason is, and I'm sure my colleagues that are deployed will agree with this. When you're downrange, when you're deployed, you think that everybody back at home, at the home bases, are all lined up and doing everything they can to be helpful. And the answer is, that ain't happening. Uh, they go to their kids' soccer games and they have a life, actually. Um, so, like, we make it up as we go. We don't have lab testing. I have a hunch that the 20-year-old guy that died of sudden cardiac death, because his autopsy was normal, was probably because he was on azithromycin and, and on his own took Lomodal for his diarrheal illness. And I think he died of a cardiac rhythm disturbance because both of those things can cause that. So, but I can't prove that. We don't have laboratory to guide us when out in the boonies. So we're kind of treating empirically. Um, the, fortunately, I have my friends and colleagues back here at the Kansas Intelligence Fusion Center. I could get a hold of them one way or the other and get an answer in um, day on like something uh, like a malaria vaccine. What's the status of that? There was some discord because Aussies and Brits come in with the malaria vaccine, which isn't effective. But it caused, and then our soldiers are saying, why do I have to take anti-malarials when these guys are getting vaccinated for it? So I put out a request for information, got a quick turnaround. It took six weeks for our rear element in, oh, I'll say South Carolina or something that was supposedly supporting us. So it was a source of frustration, not at all efficient for getting that. Um, and we MacGyvered it. Shouldn't have been that way, but that's what it is. Ready? 
So you've talked about the suicide rate over there, and then I've read um, articles about how intense it is for soldiers once they come back. When they're when you're over there, uh, is there training that um, is given to soldiers about things to watch for? Yes, and there. Are, they, yes, Be, uh, between suicide rec uh, risk recognition, uh, sexual assault and harassment, uh, all a lot of training goes on. And I think it's actually pretty good training. And interestingly, the suicides that we that I was involved with, even in retrospect, there was nothing that anybody could tumble to, except that they were these float pool, these uh, theater coordinated assistants, people that were pulled from their unit and went to a different, every one of them was that. And I don't know that that's, that's not a scientific study, but it tells me that they're at more risk. The other thing, that, and I didn't comment on it, it's fascinating, there's other thing uh, that there's bad, you know, people have habits, like for example, when we train at the range, you, you shoot and, or, or, and then you go down and pick up your brass and you put it in your pocket, right? We had a, a fellow that was killed be, who went blang, 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 and then bent down to pick up his brass and got shot and killed. And in combat, you don't, that's a habit you should not have because the world doesn't care if you leave those brass casings on there. And it's hard to think to even train to that, mm -hmm. you know. Bob. Thanks, Lee. Um, you've talked a couple of, you made a couple of points. You know, one you said that there was training in field for suicide and recognition of problems mm -hmm. like that. You talked about um, the challenges of working in a challenging, difficult environment when the support, support, People are off at the golf. Yeah, um, and, and you know we as civilians we hear about these difficult, you know, how complicated and challenging it is, and, and frankly how screwed up it seems to be um, in 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 theatre. Do you feel like it? It's two questions. One, do you feel like it's getting better or worse? I mean, certainly from where I sit, it sounds like suicides are getting worse in the military environment. <laughs> And, and secondly, is the leadership looking to make it better, or is it an intractable problem? What are your thoughts on mm -hmm. that? Yeah, let me do the. Well, first off, the number of suicides we had in theater was less than an age and gender matched cohort in the United States that are not military. I'll let that sink in for just a minute. Um, and I th so I think that's an endemic. Suicide is an endemic problem, not just in the military, but in the civilian world. Not, and, as, and then, of course, we have a lot of young troops, too, 18 to 24-year-olds. A lot of them deploy for the money because they get, they get, their income goes up there. Um, and I didn't comment. We, for every suicide that occurred, we probably had, I, I'm just making an amount, 20, 30 people that were up 40, 50, 100, I don't know, a huge number that were identified and got involved with counseling and or returned from active duty back to the United States, et cetera. So I think our success rate in those that identify themselves or are identified by somebody around them, I think it's actually getting better. The numbers in the military, at least in deployed populations, are getting better. Um, but I think that we haven't scratched the surface on suicide as a, as a society. And it's, I think it's kind of blown through a megaphone because it gets a lot of scrutiny. In the military, there's better accounting for it. I don't think, Bob, I answered your question completely, but I think that there's a lot of attention paid to it, and I think leadership is very tuned into it. And, and the, the leadership of the military organization at large, would you comment on that? The, um, I, I don't mean individual people, but, but no. is, is, the, is the stomach there to try and make what you're telling us about better? Yes. And, and are the resources, is it, is it a resource problem? Is it a thinking problem? I think that it's a little bit like weight management or fitness. It, it, death by PowerPoint is not a way to t train people to be good at recognizing or, or uh, involving themselves with a person that has risk factors for suicide. And I think some of the times, I'm looking at my military colleagues, I think some of the times that we go through a training sequence to recognize or involve ourselves with somebody at risk and, and check the box because there I've given you the briefing now we can go to lunch you know so I, I think it can be done better there's good there's a lot of rhetoric put toward it but I think that we still need to do a lot better it really it's a question we're adult learners 
you know, and adult leaders. How do we learn? How do we lead? And what is a meaningful way to train people? Yeah. I guess there are no other questions. Uh, I want to personally uh, thank everybody for coming and wish you a happy Thanksgiving and thank Dr. Norman for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't be trusted.